Okay, so then let's begin. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Environmental uh, Research Webinar. I am Song Gyun Park, a faculty member of uh, Epidemiology and uh, Environmental Health Sciences. So this seminar series is sponsored by uh, Michigan Life Stage Environmental Exposure and Disease Center, MLEAD. So today, we, I'm very excited to have a, a really interesting topic and speaker, uh, Dr. Suruthi Mahalingaya. So Dr. Mahalingaya is an assistant professor of environmental, reproductive, and women's health at the Harvard PH Chan School of Public Health. She served clinically as a physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where she specialized in ovulation disorders, reproductive endocrinology, and infertility. Her research seeks seek to understand the links between environmental and modifiable risk factors on human reproduction and gynecological diseases. Uh, Dr. Mahalingaya is the creator of the ovulation and menstru menstruation health study and one of the principal investigators of the Apple Women's Health Study. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mahalingaya. Thank, thank you, you so much. much, Dr. Park. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really exciting to share this research with you. Um, and uh, I wish we were also in person, but I look forward to answering some of the questions at the end of the talk. Um, this talk is focused on environmental exposures and menstrual cycle characteristics. Here's just a little uh, research support and I have no conflicts of interest. Um, today's talk is going to go over some basics about menstrual cycle characteristics in terms of how we can look at them um, either in uh, a biological setting or in a research setting and then um, looking a little bit into sensitive time windows of exposure and some of the questions that we're asking um, in my research group. So we'll spend a moment on this. Um, this is an overview of menstrual cycle characteristics overlaid with the reproductive health timeline. In the circles, we have kind of age um, with starting with zero at birth, Marching along, we've got the life stages of birth, puberty, menarche, peak fertility, decline, and menopause. Um, and some of the menstrual cycle characteristics that I'll mention in today's talk include age at menarche, happening at menarche, the first period, um, time to cycle regularity, which is how long it takes for the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis to establish maturity and have um, regular, more predictable cycles. Well, um, the other outcomes include menstrual cycle length. I'll uh, share a little bit about that definition in a moment. Regularity, irregularity, and then some ovulation disorders um, such as polycystic ovary syndrome, premature ovarian insufficiency, and hypothalamic or functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. There are others, um, but not each, not every disorder is the same, even if they manifest with cycle irregularity. In terms of what this looks like for um, one's oocytes over time, um, this again has the same motif, but also shows how many oocytes exist. Um, and we have a peak number of oocytes in mid gestation in a female sex at birth infant of about six to seven million, about one to two million at birth, a half a million at puberty with a continuous attrition to about 25,000 at age 37 and about 1,000 around the time of menopause. One of my um, areas of interest and study over my career has been on, you know, in understanding and looking at different environmental exposures and the menstrual cycle. So um, what regulates the menstrual cycle it are reproductive hormones. And so there are hormones um, that communicate through neuroendocrine signaling, signaling at that hypothalamic to pituitary area, kind of right up here. This is a little brain going down with GnRH pulse frequency signaling to the anterior pituitary, secreting um, LH and FSH, which are giving signals to the ovaries. 
to recruit an egg, um, get that egg to ovulation, and um, also for the secretion and production of estrogen and progesterone, which then feed back, stimulate, or inhibit depending on the specific time window in the cycle. Um, additional kind of aspects in the brain and the pituitary. Clearly, um, endocrine disruption can be one of the mechanisms that may interfere with this kind of signaling um, throughout different stages of development. And I think that we may even be exploring other forms of disruption or um, impact across the lifespan. So in terms of um, how those hormones communicate, um, this is just a very high level look at luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, GNRH pulse frequency across um, different time windows. So um, the neonatal time window, right after birth, childhood, reproductive timelines, of course, let's not forget puberty and um, anarchy and the um, general um, feedback and feed forward um, capabilities are there, but the tissues and the developmental stages are very, very different. I think it's important to keep in mind when thinking about designing environmental exposure studies with this um, outcome of the menstrual cycle, which I think is very sensitive to um, our outside environment. So in terms of the cycle, I'll just establish some definitions here in the circular part at the top. This is kind of like a deconstructed menstrual cycle with about the first half being the follicular phase where the ovary, um, in terms of the ovarian um, biology, has follicles that are getting recruited. Every follicle has an egg inside, but only typically one egg gets to ovulate um, in the mid-cycle at ovulation. That follicle then converts into a corpus luteum, secreting progesterone, defining kind of that luteal phase. So here for period one, we have about five bleeding days followed by the remainder of the follicular phase where an oocyte or a follicle is being um, kind of establishing its dominance and then ovulating at ovulation and then the luteal phase. And you can see period two is kind of unraveled here um, in a linear way, which helps when thinking about studies and study design. So um, in terms of studying the menstrual cycle um, and asking questions around um, menstrual cycle characteristics, it's important to get a sense of what cohorts might be available or what, or what cohorts we might need to design or build to be able to ask um, questions of this nature. And so I'll talk about um, very briefly a couple of studies that have come out of the Apple Women's Health Study um, here at Harvard Chan School of Public Health and um, in collaboration with Apple as well as the National Institute for Environmental Health Science. So this um, study is an observational study designed to advance the understanding of menstrual cycles and gynecologic conditions. Eligibility um, requirements include having menstruated at least once and being 18 years old, um, older in some states in the US, having an iPhone and living in the United States. You don't have to have an Apple Watch to enroll, just an iPhone. So the data collection is um, uh, somewhat innovative and has data streams, including survey data, health kit-based data, which is uh, within the iPhone, and sensor-based data. So within the health kit, you can see some of the data um, types here. And I'll show you in a moment what is available in the sensor data from the watch. This is just a diagram of all the different surveys um, within the, um, the study. And we have a variety of different kind of general surveys as well as a menstrual status survey and, and um, interval updates annually. And um, each participant can choose what data type is contributed and all responses are optional. So in one of our first papers, we just kind of overview the design and methods of the study. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize while an Apple Watch is not required for participation, about 72% of um, participants had an Apple Watch and contributed data. In terms of the watch sensor derived metrics, here is just a little bit to think through about the external environment, what we can look at, and then some aspects of the internal environment or our um, biology and physiology related to kind of heart rate and. Um, activity status. So um, 
When we first started looking at understanding menstrual cycle characteristics across the lifespan in this cohort, um, we explored a lot of things, but I've summarized kind of um, some of the papers that have been published or currently under review here. Um, and those circled in red are what we're gonna cover momentarily, but we've included um, kind of here at the bottom, age at menarche and time to cycle regularity trended across from 1950 to 2005. We um, were looking and exploring seasonal variations in cycle length and by demographic characteristics. And then we had the opportunity to look at kind of an acute exposure, which was the COVID-19 vaccine and cycle lengths. Um, here are the papers just in reference form. So you have them uh, if you have any interest in looking them up. And here I um, am sharing work that Zifan Wang and Gautam Asakan, two members of our team, um, took the lead on evaluating. And in this analytical cohort of 71,341 individuals um, born between 1950 and 2005, we did see an early, sorry, a temporal trend towards an earlier age at menarche, as well as a longer time to cycle regularity. And um, these trends were noted to have some differences among demographic groups with the BMI at menarche overall was notable for meeting a part of this trend, um, almost 50%. So we'll just take a look at, at what this um, looks like. So this is a little bit about our question and our um, approach to making a causal diagram from birth year to age at menarche and time to cycle regularity with kind of what um, covariates we were evaluating and what we were able to obtain at enrollment from this cohort. In terms of the analytical sample, um, it, it was clearly whittled down from approximately 98,520 individuals to about 71,000 who had age at menarche and about 62,000 who had responded to the time to cycle regularity question. This gives you a bigger picture view of kind of the the bigger picture research questions and potential mechanisms we're interested in, we, we were able to look at the variables highlighted in blue, um, but clearly the ones in green are um, important to consider um, in the future and for cohorts that have that available information. So looking at what we found um, in panel A, you can see the mean age at menarche over birth years, and we kind of made um, birth year cohorts kind of shown here. Um, and in panel B, we show the percentage with early or late age at menarche. So less than 11 years old, we defined as earlier menarche, um, and that's in the lavender pink. You can see that kind of increasing over time with those with kind of a, a later menarche maybe. Um, over 16 years old, declining slightly in the orange. And then finally in panel C, time from menarche to cycle regularity, which for me indicates maturation of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. Um, you have the light blue indicates that kind of time being two years or less up to a dark blue not yet regular and the yellow being regular after hormone use. And you can kind of see that there is a smaller proportion of individuals achieving cycle regularity within two years and a larger proportion taking either more than five years, not yet regular, or um, it's hard to say with the regular after home when you there's some fluctuation there, but um, an, an interesting uh, pattern to note. We looked at the um, time trends for BMI at Menarche in our cohort and um, you can kind of see across the time windows that that did increase as well. And then the mediation showed about a 45% um, attribution to BMI at, at Menarche for this relationship, which leads the question, you know, what are the contributors to the temporal trends in age at Menarche that we're seeing outside of um, kind of adiposity, childhood ad adiposity, maybe transgenerational, um, adiposity um, beyond that, how are endocrine disrupting chemicals or toxicants um, playing a role here, including those 
consumed in our diet and other factors, including psychosocial stress um, and other early life adversity events. I don't have answers to that, but it, um, this was the first to kind of show that increased time to cycle regularity uh, as a indicator of a menstrual cycle characteristic shift. So we'll shift to looking at other kind of high level um, information around menstrual cycle characteristics within this cohort. So in this, we looked at um, menstrual cycle length variation by demographic characteristics and our postdoc, Hoi Chu Lee, who has um, moved on to a wonderful job in industry, hopefully she'll come back to research one day, um, has um, looked at these patterns. And what we found um, was very similar to established literature with a shortening of the cycle until about age 50 and then uh, an elongation with a decline in, in ovarian function. Um, we were able to have some more representation than some existing studies. Um, I apologize, my video panel is right on top of some of this information. So, um, and we saw that um, there's a little bit more variability in certain groups. And we also were able to look at those participants with a higher BMI in relation to their cycle variability. For this, um, and I just wanted to show a little bit about how we thought about the menstrual cycle length from the log data. So as part of this analysis, we took survey data as well as the data from the health kit where participants can um, allow uh, us to evaluate their log menstrual cycle data in the following way. So the dark red circles um, represent the period, any shade of red or pink are days with menstrual flow and then the empty circles are days with no flow. Um, we had to apply some sort of logic to what constitutes the cycle. Some um, participants only track the first day of their menstrual flow, even if they may have had more. And um, so we had to apply some um, concepts to defining what a period might be in this um, data. We also had additional survey questions regarding were all the bleeding days um, accurately logged to further evaluate um, cycle lengths. And then the menstrual cycle length was calculated as the interval between the first day of a period or a bleeding day until the day before the first day of the next menses or period. So this is just showing you what it kind of looked to clean the data and um, take into account potentially some logging artifacts. So um, if there was um, an over 15 day difference, we thought that there may have been a skip cycle and those um, were also uh, excluded in this analysis just to have the best threshold of uh, normal cycle length um, for that individual. And that was defined as by the individual skip tracking threshold. And you can see here in yellow, that's a distribution of kind of what we thought were non-artifactual or accurate menstrual cycles. And in the purple, these could have been artifacts or part of um, a missed logging of a cycle. We also looked at, um, Hui Chu was very interested in uh, seasonal variation in cycle lengths. So we looked at um, seasonal variation within this cohort and we found shorter um, cycle lengths in a fraction of a day from May to August compared to January and April. Um, and um, just shown here is some kind of high level findings, but um, in conclusion, these are very small cycle length differences that may be more pronounced in individuals that might have an ovulation disorder such as those with PCOS. And we did not see a seasonal pattern in those above the age of 40, maybe suggesting that ovarian reserve is more determining cycle length patterns at that point. So just shows just a little bit more of, of how that looked from a month to month basis. And again, this the differences were very, very mild. Um, and we concluded not necessarily very clinically significant, although um, from a clinical standpoint, I found the information for those with ovulation disorder PCOS and their seasonal, um, a little bit more of a seasonal pattern interesting. 
So I think this might be the last paper I'll highlight from this cohort, and this is looking at uh, COVID-19 vaccination. We found a very small increase in cycle length um, that uh, over time um, was very temporary and it, every individual went back to their pre-vaccine cycle pattern. This was led by uh, Lizzie Gibson and Hui Chu. Um, and I'll just show you our definitions. So this was looking within each participant. So the participant served as their own control and we compared uh, pre-vaccine to vaccination to post-vaccine and adjusted for age, BMI, and season. Looking here um, on the right, an individual like A, say, had an mRNA vaccine. This is the circles each represent a menstrual cycle. So, you know, they may have contributed um, three or more pre-vaccination cycles. They would have had a first dose and a second dose and then contributed um, several post-vaccination cycles. For individuals that had a viral vector vaccine, they would have contributed some pre-vaccination cycles, had a vaccine cycle, and then had post-vaccination cycles. Oh, and then, so before I transition to the next area, um, we'll conclude with this. Um, this the, our findings were very comparable to the previously published literature from other uh, cohorts that were using menstrual log data. And um, we were able to kind of do this analysis within an individual um, for a little more, we think, precise um, effect estimates. So I'm gonna change topics a little bit to thinking about um, other exposures and menstrual cycle characteristics. And this is work from a funded R01. And shown here is kind of the schematic diagram of the exposures and the different aims, looking at a variety of environmental exposures from air pollutants, climate factors, um, roadway proximity, so traffic-related air pollution, and um, also bringing in the concept of potential disparities in exposures to these um, uh, factors, and then looking at menstrual cycle characteristics. So we talked a little bit about age at menarche, um, not too much about regularity per se, but menstrual cycle length, time to cycle regularity in different cohorts, and then looking at um, a ovulation disorder, polycystic ovary syndrome, which is very common and has high um, morbidity across the lifespan um, in a different cohort. And Thinking about the R01 in terms of the life course um, approach, we just have a little bit of that spelled out here, very similar to the Apple Women's Health Study in some ways for the outcomes. Um, and I just wanted to bring this into the conversation. There is a, a natural decline in oocytes over time. There might be an acceleration from environmental toxicants. This isn't necessarily what may be underlying the etiology of an ovulation disorder from polycystic ovary syndrome, but I think it's important to consider um, exposures to different toxicants at different time windows may not lead, lead to a uh, normal atresia, maybe it leads to reduced atresia, further um, impacting kind of signaling and ovulation disorders. So this is a summary schematic here looking at um, across the lifespan, air pollution, climate, other environmental and social factors, and then kind of the, the three windows that we're looking at in this um, R01, so gestational exposures, and summarized in the middle is the potential mechanisms of ovarian toxicity, endocrine disruption, and developmental impacts. The cohort um, we're using for that is the Growing Up Today study, which are the children born to the Nurses Health Study 2 participants. So we have the prenatal um, addresses, and we can kind of define some of their exposures during that time. We're looking at childhood and premenarchal exposures, both in that um, growing up today's study, as well as a, a newly enrolling cohort, the Nurses Health Study 3, which also has um, geocoded um, location from um, across the lifespan encompassing childhood and premenarchal windows. And finally, we're looking at the adult reproductive window in the Nurses 3, as well as a cohort um, that I helped Curate out of Boston Medical Center, which is a safety net hospital and serves a very diverse um, population of individuals, both from race to ethnicity, but also from a socioeconomic 
um, background standpoint. And so when looking a little closer at the kind of spatial lead determined variables are listed out here, and some of the social variables are listed here. And um, you know, we're very early in, in looking at this um, literature and have started a little bit on understanding some of the um, disparities and even getting a diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome, which um, is a kind of multifactorial diagnosis, including a clinical visit, endocrine testing, um, menstrual cycle history, and um, its manifestations are irregular periods with androgen excess, so excess facial or body hair, in some definitions, cystic acne, and um, in a, some other groups, alopecia or um, androgenic hair loss. So we are starting to explore understanding the disparity in that. And um, my doctoral student, Emily Silva, has started looking at this. And I think um, it's important to kind of get a sense of the differences in um, the actual diagnosis with the clinical code for the diagnosis so we can bring in the undiagnosed cases into our analysis. So she started looking at this um, PCOS under diagnosis patterns by race, ethnicity, insurance status, primary language, and spatial social vulnerability measures. Um, and this is kind of the conceptual model leading to a PCOS diagnosis. Um, and unfortunately, we are finding some trends even at um, one of the best places to receive care with excellent interpreter services. So I think um, it's it's really uh, helping to define um, how we think about that outcome and bringing in algorithm-defined disease such as algorithm-defined PCOS or algorithm-defined other ovulation disorders into our um, approach. And so with that, I will conclude maybe a few minutes, like I thought I had 30 minutes, but um, I'm a few minutes early, but I'm happy to take questions. And I wanted to thank um, the team at the Channing um, overseeing the Growing Up Today study and the Nurses Health Study 3, Jamie Hart and Jorge Chavarro, our other postdoc on that side, the BU team, our Apple team here at NIEHS and at Apple, and then colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health and the MGH Fertility Center. So thanks everyone. And I'm happy to take questions or open discussion. Great. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, so the, the, the Apple Women's uh, Health Study and, and also the, uh, uh, the several Cohort study you are incorporating uh, in terms of the, this uh, PCOS and uh, the menstrual cycle uh, characteristic study. And uh, so uh, anyone who have any questions, uh, please you can enter your question to the, the Q&A uh, and then uh, I will go over those questions. And uh, the, Dr. Mahalingaya, yeah, you can also look at the, the question directly. You open the Q&A. And then we will go over that. So uh, while we are waiting for uh, some question, uh, maybe I can start uh, first. And so the Apple Women's Health Study sounds very interesting using the you know this um, the you know smartphone and then more um, you know this the like real time data collection and then uh, you can also expand this uh, you know very large. Uh, the course uh, large number of participants. Uh, so the but the, you also you were involved in the more traditional epidemiology study, and then uh, you can collect the data more uh, in a way that you can uh, you know the measure more accurately and then more precisely. So uh, can you share your experience about uh, you know the between these two different uh, you know the study design and the data collection approach? And so what? what this Apple Women's Health Study can uh, fill in the area where this more traditional cohort study can miss. And so that's why this study can uh, contribute to, you know, improve this uh, epidemiologic study. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I think um, historically, so when I was Doing my K research years, I um, was really interested in looking at gynecologic diseases in the nurses' health study too, and air pollution exposure. So I was like, okay, well, let's look at all of them. 
um, endometriosis, fibroids, infertility, and then we um, ended up with menstrual cycle characteristics, irregularity, and a combination of androgen excess. And um, what I saw was it was just a little harder to to see um, really good data on menstrual cycle characteristics specifically. It's hard to collect those and understand the variation in two years. And so I looked at a lot of other cohorts, the um, Cape Cod Health Study and Exposure Outcome Study on Cape Cod for tetrachloroethylene and the Framingham Heart Study. Um, some of the questions were asked, but not a lot of responses were recorded um, when we did the best we could. But then um, kind of expanding out with the innovation of menstrual cycle um, apps, I thought maybe we could answer a little bit better with that information. And so explored um, making up a cohort of my own, you know, using digital tools with the ovulation menstrual health, health study. I think um, the innovation that the Apple Women's Health Study is contributing is um, definitely part of the platform for data stream merging and collection and then um, being able to kind of access and assess all of those data streams um, after, of course, uh, an appropriate question is, is being asked to them. So, you know, like in epidemiology, nothing is perfect. There's never one perfect cohort. There's never one perfect um, study, maybe for one question at one point in time. But um, I do think this type of cohort has the potential to um, fill in some gaps, like we saw with the COVID-19 vaccination, at least some surveillance level information on, you know, acute exposures, maybe high level um, trends in some of these characteristics, age at menarche, time to cycle regularity, so we can reflect on what what is driving those trends, are those unhealthy, and how we can kind of move towards identifying why and, and preventing it if it's a concern. Um, in terms of specifically, um, I think, um, from a prevention standpoint, being able to study your own body with your steps and, and different things might be a nice way to influence behavior for improved um, healthy behaviors. Great. Yeah, we have a number of questions that <laughs> came in. And so uh, because we are now recording and then we will post this to the, the YouTube channel later. So even though you can see the, please look at the question, but I will... Okay. Um, read the question as well. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, uh, why did you analyze four cycles post-vaccination and why not more? One of the big reasons is that um, the booster became available as fast as five cycles before or after um, the initial vaccination. So that is why we truncated at four. But for those, and and based on how we were sending out the survey, sometimes it's harder to see when the booster vaccine cycle was. However, that's why we truncated at four, but could include more. Okay, so the next question is, how generalizable is uh, the Apple Women's Health Study in terms of socioeconomic status? I could imagine it uh, not be very representative if so many women already had Apple Watches and iPhone. Yeah, so that um, question was what we tried to answer in the design and methods paper. Um, if you look at it, the question we asked for socioeconomic status, and this is a collaborative study, um, of course, across three institutions, was based on the MacArthur um, scale. So one uh, responds in relation to comparing themselves to other people. And that tool is validated for some things, but it's hard to make a direct kind of monetary income comparison. But yeah, I think always this cohort will have a question mark of how generalizable it is based on um, the demographics of um, iPhone users and wearers. Um, some of what we, you know, it's hard to be completely reductionist, but for some aspects of our um, exposure outcome relationships or time trend studies, I think they may hold true outside of that. But um, for others, we really discuss this um, concept. So um, I can't answer it very discreetly of how representative it is, 
but if we compare it to um, the population from kind of like what's reported in the CDC and proportion of individuals per race ethnicity category, maybe it's a little more representative than other cohorts, such as the nurses health study um, cohorts have been, um, or Framingham Heart, but before the Omni cohorts, but um, maybe we don't have an answer regarding the socioeconomic status piece. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is, have you explored the feminine hygiene product and how they may contribute exposure that impact menstrual cycle characteristics? This is a great question. And um, I didn't put the slide in where you could go to our study website and follow our social handles. So maybe I will try to put that in the chat in just a moment. But um, stay tuned. I can't say anything more than Okay. All right. Uh, have you had any pushback or uh, reluctancy for women to provide information on menstrual cycle after changes in reproductive right in your study? If so, any recommendation on how to overcome these participant concerns? I think this is a very important question. Um, I think at a high level, um, we haven't had any compromises in our um enrollment, but I do think that it's an important question and we're thinking through this um, right now. Yeah. Um, hello, thank you for this wonderful talk. If, you, if your research was expanded to a global health context, what would be important to consider? What fears are uh, important about this work in the context of global environmental health? So thanks for that question. Um, one of the considerations I have had is that some of the exposure distributions in the U.S. may be kind of lower than in other areas in the world. And I think um, it would be really important to know if there is a potentiation for kind of air pollution exposures at, at much higher levels and the ovulation disorders we're seeing in other parts of the world. Um, I think that could be an implication of expanding this globally. I think um, it's always important to ha uh, have voices of, um, you know, humans all over the world. So I think just for understanding kind of even further seasonal geographic variation, all of these things, it would be um, fantastic. I, in terms of this specific cohort expanding, I, I can't answer that per se, but I do think it's it's really important to have that in mind. And if you have the opportunity to do that, I think it'd be really, really helpful to fill in just the experience gap for, you know, what does this mean in different parts of the world and what are the effect estimates and are they much worse and are they impacting ultimately, you know, a variety of downstream aspects of reproductive health and women's health. Hmm. Well, maybe relate to this question. So that from your study, you you look at the like a seasonal variation and that you see just uh little variation that was a point to so that do you also see the like a geographic variation within us or the uh you know the more warmer uh area versus more uh cold area and uh I mean, over everything the seasonal was variation. minimal within one day and i have to look back at the actual point estimates but it wasn't something where i'd be worried at least in this cohort for this moment in time that it was influencing um in some way kind of uh, an exposure outcome relationship. But I think it's important to see, uh, we didn't do, um, yeah. So it wasn't a major impact. Okay. Uh, next I'll question. Yeah. yeah. The impact on cycle length, do you see it during follicular phase or luteal phase? I was thinking in, in relation to re recruitment. Uh, recruitment vs. atresia. The impact on cycle length, do you see it during follicular phase or luteal phase? Okay. Um, yes, this is a very important question. So in terms of uh, recruiting the follicles and the more follicles you have, the more oocytes a person has, sometimes follicular phase length is longer. So we, in, in the first, in the Apple Women's Health Study, we have the log data. So I don't have a gold standard on when someone ovulates, 
we can apply kind of algorithms to um, back calculate day of ovulation and that's the best we can do, but we don't have a true like ovulation capture. So um, we weren't really able to answer was it follicular or, or luteal phase? Um, we did, I, I think in the COVID-19 paper, look at attempting to look at that question, you know, by um, assigning a value to the luteal phase and then kind of looking when the vaccine was administered. But um, it's hard to say, but it would impact either follicular recruitment, delay um, recruitment in general, and um, I think it would be interesting to really understand that more. Good. Uh, actually, we also have a couple of questions uh, in the chat box, not the Q&A. And so we will come back to the, the question in the Q&A, but I want to cover another question in the chat. So can you talk a little bit more about how you adjust for the confounding factor in your linear model? I am curious how you decide what adjustment to make and how much weight they have. Additionally, I am wondering if you uh, tracked occupation in the core study. All right, I will take the tracking occupation first and um, I might need to engage in a conversation for the linear models and confounding adjustment. But um, the first question is no, we don't have occupation right now. Um, I think it's important to include. And then in terms of adjust for confounding, I think that there are time invariant pieces that we included, but I would have to look back and see and um, maybe offline if you could email me your questions, we can have a conversation, but some of the stuff was not um, changing cycle to cycle. Okay, going back to the Q&A and then uh, relating to the results of earlier menarche in women, now compared to women who were born earlier, is it possible that the women who went through menarche earlier in previous decade are just not enrolled in the study either by random chance or because of some other factor? There is a possibility. I mean, the earlier birth co cohorts could have also passed away. So the healthier individuals are living longer. So that is a key consideration in that time trend. Okay. So in the women's health study, I think this uh, referring to the Apple women's health study. So have you seen geographic, di oh, geographic differences between the Eastern and Western side of Massachusetts? I don't think we've looked to look at that, actually. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't compared the state. But, so the relate to the question that I asked. So mm -hmm. the so within this small uh, like message set, but just uh, you know the west of the US versus east or south and north, and there may be some uh, geographic variation, uh, mm -hmm. although the, the difference may not be large. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. All right, um, and then the next question is, is your Apple Women's Health Study group considering expanding the study to multiple languages, including I Spanish? think that's a great idea. I, I love that thought of like language inclusivity. It would be nice. Have you restrict restricted your analysis among women who have not reached menopause, women who reached menopause and women who didn't, their menstrual characteristics might not be compatible. That's exactly right. Yes. Um, for each different analysis, there are kind of reproductive life stage criteria um, and kind of cutoff. So less than 45 for some, less than 38 for others, less than 50 for others, but exactly right. Yeah. Okay, are there any concerns that progressive change in uh, menarche onset may have uh, effect on fertility years or onset of menopause? I think that there is, that's a great question. Um, I think there is a concern about how, how that might affect health across each stage. Um, but um, 
in terms of the answer to those questions, I don't know um, in this cohort. Okay, so the final question in the Q&A. So do you have any ability to track when participants drop out of the Apple Women's Health Study? Yes, we do. Yeah. And then, so like the, when they just log out and was, so that is something you, you track? Uh, this person yeah, drop withdrawal. out. Okay. We can understand withdrawal rates just to make sure we understand if there's something major going on with the population and to understand who is in the cohort. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then we have one more question in uh, in the chat. So, are there variation when compared to the immigrant population? So right now, we don't have a good question to identify who is, um, you know, who is an immigrant and at what point they um, emigrated in. But I think that this is a very interesting question for sure. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to think about this at some point. Yeah. Yeah, so great. Yeah, so this is very interesting, uh, you know, the uh, Q&A. And I think that many people, uh, you know, thinking think about and then ask a question about uh, like the study design population in the, the Apple women's health study which indicate that the people are very interested in this you know more digital uh, data collection approach and how they can uh, improve and also contribute to you know the this uh, hard to collect the data but uh, you know more wide and the large scale uh, population and then how they can impact uh, you know this uh, women's health study uh, this menstrual cycle characteristics and and so on so uh the this q a reflect that uh interest by the the audience and i really appreciate uh the audience question and also the dr malingaya your uh detailed answer thank you thank you for the questions and the invitation again um, it's exciting to see so much interest. And um, of course, um, everyone is invited to email me for any further discussion about these topics. I think um, it's exciting to see the interest because we do need to fill the gaps. And many of the questions the attendees ask, like we need answers to that to be able to um, design and, and have you know prevention and interest in kind of women's health across the lifespan. Great. Okay. So uh, I hope, you know, when you have more uh, reader and then we can invite you again and then learn about, you know, how this Apple uh, Women's Health Study and other core studies. So you are showing the association between environmental exposure and uh, this, you know, important, uh, important, but very understudied topic. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you very much for your great presentation and then the audience. Uh, I, so we really appreciate your particip uh, participation. And so we will continue this uh, environmental research seminar and webinar uh, in February and in March. Thank you very much and have a nice day.